Hello everyone, my name is David Rousseau, working at University of Angers, France. Happy to be with you for this machine and deep learning on the cloud uh, tutorial uh, with a focus on classification. The first uh, to, to start with, as I, I was not fully aware of um, how far you were advanced on um, uh, how uh, machine and deep learning uh, shifted or made evolve the, the standard practice of image processing. I wanted to decomplexify and uh, make you easy with uh, what is um, um, machine and deep learning that I personally see as just an automation of the uh, old school way of doing image analysis and image processing. So uh, this, this, this short introduction is to make you easy that if you are uh, completely new on this topic actually, you will not have to start from uh, scratch, but actually all the things you knew will be useful uh, in this world of uh, machine learning or deep learning um, uh, driven uh, image processing. Basically, uh, in your classical way of doing image processing, you have uh, images. Here it's a 2D image, which is uh, seen uh, in, this, in this way. Um, and um, uh, a, a lot of the, the methods uh, which are used in bio-image bio analyst uh, co consist in um, having some uh, local filtering in order to, to produce uh, filtered uh, uh, images. And this uh, local filtering is, uh, in most of the case, based on the local um, uh, patch on which some statistics is, um, is made. Uh, when linear filters are applied, these uh, local statistics are very often uh, just weighted sums. Uh, and uh, if this uh, local patch is swept onto the image in this way, Actually, uh, we call this um, a convolution in electrical engineering, and it's pretty similar to the way uh, in neurosciences, uh, biological neurons are pulling information uh, with a weight corresponding to the power of the of the synapse, uh, the, the weight of the synapse, and um, and basically, so we see that there is already from the old school way of doing image processing and this uh, neuro uh, trend already a, a, a beginning of analogy uh, there and the connection. So when we have a, a, a problem, what we usually do is we have an input image. We, we can take a, a filter to uh, enhance uh, some um, elements uh, in the image and then we put a, a classifier or regression. In our case, we will take care only of a classifier to, to produce an output image on which the, the final information can be instruct, extracted. So basically, a visual installation that first you have your raw images. It's important to keep in mind that in the old school area, era and in the machine learning uh, era, the, the, the denoising is still very uh, important and can be done with machine learning, but can, can also be done with standard methods. And then um, you extract your feature, for instance, edges here, and to take a decision, for instance, here if there is someone in the scene or uh, nobody uh, in the scene, which is basically what is a classification, an, imo an image as an input and a class as an output. A simplest classifier that you all know uh, correspond to a thresholding, where for each pixel you will decide if it's below or above a given uh, a threshold. And um, if uh, you are familiar with uh, Imagi, uh, you know that there are. Uh, it's always tricky to to, to find the, the good uh, the good threshold, and you can test all kind of method based on. Uh, um, a different mathematical criterion uh, to, to, to decide what is your, your, your best uh, the best threshold uh, in order to avoid to fix it manually on each uh, on each image for instance this is actually very bad to to, to, to behave like this because uh, you, you, you you fix your threshold based on often visually so very subjectively and also on, often on a small data set so the good way of doing it would be to consider 
a, a training data set on which you have established the ground truth and then to test all possible uh, threshold to plot what is called a receiving operator curve where you plot the true positive rate as a function of the false, false positive rate and possibly to, to select the threshold which has given you the highest true posi uh, positive rate with the smallest false positive rate. And obviously this, you ask a machine to do it, uh, to, to select this and to, to do the loop on the, on the threshold and to select the best threshold. This is practices with, which are clearly inspired by machine learning and uh, for which in, in, even if it's very low dimension, uh, where the machine can of course help. Actually, uh, there are rarely problems where only one filter uh, can do the job meaning that with only one filter you have you can take a decision a strong decision a robust decision on which you extract information uh, and it's very necessary it's very often that you have the necessity to have uh, several filters and if this number of filters if the dimension of your problem overwhelms you, even your capability of visualizing uh, your uh, feature space meaning the the, the the coordinate of a point having uh, the the different uh, filter as a as a uh, as scalars, then uh, this is where the machine can indeed help uh, again. Where you take your image, you extract uh, M filters that we call features, and then you put a classifier which take decision not now in one dimension but in multiple dimensions. And this is classical machine learning uh, which is used there where the expert fixes the filters and the machine uh, works in a multidimensional space to produce classification or regression. This is exactly what you do in a very standard now tools such as Weka, Elastic, Lab LabKit, Zen, Cupass, uh, which are applying what is called random forest uh, in uh, this um, uh, series of uh, uh, output of uh, filters to take uh, decision on um, uh, object classification or pixel uh, classification for segmentation uh, based on pixel-based decisions. And today we'll talk about more deep learning, which is just one step further in the use of uh, the machines, where in fact the feature extraction is not uh, designed by a human, but is designed by the machine itself, so that we talk about end-to-end -end learning, meaning that the as feature space on which the decision is based has been learned uh, together with the classifier itself. So the first take-home message, if you were very uh, um, beginners in this, is that machine learning is not new tool, but automation of existing one. It's pretty helpful for large data set and hard problems. If you have a simple problem with a single threshold can do the job, please do it this way. And when large feature space are requested to, uh, to solve the problem, the larger the feature space, the larger the need of annotated data set. As a consequence, annotation is the new bottleneck to in uh, bioimage analysis. So remember that we will use deep learning, especially when we have a sufficient amount of instances, meaning sufficient amount of images to typically uh, 10 to power of 4 uh, images to be classified. Uh, have to be uh, annotated. We will see uh, uh, at some point that it's possible to reduce by a factor of 10, let's say, uh, the number of annotated uh, images, let's say 1,000, when you use what is called data augmentation. Uh, historically, the, the one of the first uh, 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 success story in, uh, in deep learning was uh, based on work by uh, Yann Lequin uh, on uh, digit uh, classification, where, uh, which is often used in a bank industry, where you have this uh, check to be recognized uh, uh, automatically. It's a very labor-intensive uh, uh, work. And uh, this uh, scientist designed the first uh, called uh, convolutional uh, neural network. And uh, we will go today through the comprehensive uh, explanation of how this, uh, how this architecture uh, works. So you have to uh, be aware, if not already done, that deep learning is a revolution because it's end-to-end -end learning and it has uh, scientific consequences. In the past, uh, you could have a jungle of image processing algorithm for different tasks 
And nowadays, thanks of uh, the, the income of a deep learning uh, era, there is very few algorithms which are actually needed. Uh, so you have a bank of deep learning algorithms for different informational tasks. And if you are, your job is to identify the, um, if you choose deep learning for uh, your, uh, uh, solving your problems, your job consists in identifying uh, the type of uh, informational problem. So today we'll talk about classification, but you have also object detection or segmentation, which are three main uh, uh, informational tasks with which you, you can do a lot, actually. And, uh, for instance, if you have a classification problem, for instance, images of salad and wheat, and you want to detect which one uh, is, which is which, and you, you, you build uh, a neural network, such as the one we will provide to you uh, during the hands-on, and if tomorrow a new uh, problem is coming on your microscopy platform or in your uh, uh, research group, uh, if it's still classification, then actually the algorithm will uh, remain a change. You just have to retrain uh, your uh, your machine, even sometimes not from scratch, because if you have similar images which have already been used, you can use uh, the, the parameters, the weights uh, of the um, convolutions, uh, and just uh, train them uh, again to adjust the weights to the specific problem. But typically, the code will be unchanged. So that really boosts the capability of any uh, scientific group because the codes are shared and can run on uh, on clouds, either public or private, and uh, to to solve a problem. So that's really a, a change in the in the in the game of uh, image processing. Yeah. So in this talk, uh, we will first uh, go a bit more in what is classification and how classification results are measured. We will see the methods for supervised classification and go back to the basics of uh, supervised classification with deep learning. And then we will point out towards solutions on how to do deep learning based classification on the cloud. So image classification is, as I already uh, said, you put images, uh, the inputs of uh, your uh, neural network, and in the end, you want the, the, the network to take a decision uh, to assign uh, each image to a, a given uh, label. Uh, so, for instance, if you have an unwritten uh, digit, uh, in the end, uh, a decision-making will be uh, made to assign each in individual to uh, 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 a given digit. So you have to, 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 to imagine that the computer is not looking at the image in the way we, we do. It will build uh, its own what is called latent space uh, in which uh, the decision will be made. And so we hope that a good latent space would be the one we see on, on, uh, below here on the, on, on the right, where all the uh, figures belonging to a same class are pretty separated from uh, the, the the other uh, classes. Yeah. So uh, uh, here on the upper right, I would say that uh, this uh, latent space, this space where the machine takes the decision, is that is actually uh, going to give a lot of errors because there are the, uh, intercepting areas where we have um, uh, figures belonging to different classes. While here, it will be almost something perfect. Uh, to, to, to take a, a, a decision. So, there has been uh, uh, several uh, initiatives at an international level. One of the uh, initiatives that really boosted uh, the, the, the domain was this uh, ImageNet uh, data uh, challenge, image from the internet belonging to, uh, in the end, uh, several hundreds uh, of uh, uh, even thousands of uh, categories and uh, this serves as a data challenge to uh, to compete between academics and, and private companies of who could build a kind of universal classifier capable of recognizing images from the outside world let's say there has been then uh, also a specialized uh, data set such as uh, recognition of emotion, recognition of uh, manufactured object or object in, uh, in nature. 
And of course, this also uh, boosted the research on bio uh, imaging for uh, biomedical applications or uh, even uh, microscopy uh, domain as you uh, care for uh, in this training. One of the first steps when you want to design uh, an image classification uh, with deep learning methods will be again to annotate your, uh, your data. So you have a lot of uh, tools uh, that are uh, accessible uh, where you have to uh, load uh, images and then uh, you have to assign uh, a label to the to, to each uh, to each image so this is a uh, this is a job uh, which have to be uh, done manually either uh, if you uh, do the acquisition directly maybe either you can do it on the microscope directly you have uh, images from a given um, uh, object that you know already corresponds to a given uh, class and then you just save them under a, a file folder uh, a name which uh, will be uh, easy for the machine to be uh, distinguished from the other classes or the data have not been annotated at all just blindly acquired and then you need to have software for doing this so you can call services uh, to to do it for you and you just explain what you want and the, the some uh, people, uh, uh, if they are capable of uh, having this expertise of decision, can do it for you for uh, some money. Or you can do it also online via different uh, tools as uh, pointed uh, here. Um, when your classifier will be uh, uh, um, done and you want to test it, there are several metrics that you can use. Uh, a standard one is to use confusion matrix uh, where you have your actual categories, positive or negative, if you have a two, two class uh, a problem, and you have your predicted uh, categories. So this matrix is uh, true positive if you were positive and you decided positive, false positive if you were negative and you were positive, and, and, and so on. So of course, if you have a higher number of uh, classes, then your matrix will be uh, uh, extended to the, this number of classes. Is, uh, uh, then you can combine uh, in a, a single scalar uh, the, the parameter of this uh, matrix to build, for instance, the sensitivity. How often classifier predict positive results when it's actually positive to produce precision. How often classifier is correct when it predicts positive results and how often uh, overall the classifier is correct, which is called the accuracy. Another way uh, of uh, um, Characterizing the classifier is to uh, use the receiving operator curve that are already uh, uh, described to, to, to you. And uh, again, it combines parameter of the um, uh, um, confusion uh, matrix. The last uh, scores correspond to the top five error rate, which is a fraction of tested images for which the correct label is not among the five labels considered most probable uh, by the, 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 the model. Or the top one error rate, the fraction of tested images for which the correct label is not the most prob probable by the, 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 the model. So it's nice when you have many classes uh, and uh, so it's an ambiguity among these, uh, these classes. and. Uh, Having uh, these, no uh, these, these classes and these numbers enables you to, to, to probe the ambiguity uh, you have in your, uh, in your decision making. Um, this, the, 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 this classification problem has been boosted by the availability of such large data set, either specific ones or uh, ImageNet like uh, uh, ones. And uh, over the year, uh, there have been uh, improvement, great improvement by uh, uh, different uh, architecture which are now ready to be to be used and uh, which are even available as trained on ImageNet and uh, you can use yourself for your uh, images by what we call fine tuning. So you start with the weights, the parameters which has been trained on ImageNet, and then you just fine tune to uh, adapt to your specific images. So there are different tricks that have been uh, um, uh, used to to reach these improvements either by uh, increasing uh, the length of the, uh, the, the network 
basically increasing the number of uh, of layers you know, of the neurons, but also by some uh, uh, tricks to um, connect uh, differently the different layers of the uh, of the neurons. So in order to better understand uh, all these diagrams of, uh, of uh, neural networks, we need to go to uh, the basic of a supervised classification with, uh, with deep learning, and that this part, uh, the hard uh, part of the, of the talk that we now reach. So uh, what is supervised uh, learning? Uh, so you give uh, an input x and you have an output y and you have a parameterized uh, model that we'll call fw where w are the parameter of the, the, the model for which uh, you give an input and you have a prediction and in order that this prediction is as correct as possible we will define what is called a loss uh, function for each pair of uh, annotated data set corresponding to the uh, training set So uh, this loss will measure the difference between the uh, ground truth, y star, and the predicted uh, version by the parameterized model, y hat. So the global goal is to, uh, in supervised learning is to minimize uh, a loss function, which is just uh, uh, an average value of the loss on the training uh, set. So you take uh, n Uh, instance of uh, pairs and you try to minimize uh, the, uh, the difference between the, the, the predicted uh, the prediction and the ground truth and to uh, uh, the equation one is a very general formulation and for each uh, specific task you require to define the output y to define how Uh, high uh, y hat is uh, computed and to define the, the, the loss which may be different if you have a classification or, or, or regression problem uh, and so on. So the optimization of uh, the, uh, the loss is based on a gradient uh, descent where basically this function will be derived locally and uh, the weights will be made evolve in order to uh, go in the steepest direction to decrease uh, the, the loss. So the algorithm for this looks like a, a gradient descent algorithm with an iterative algorithm where the new weights uh, of the, 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 the models are based on the weights from the previous uh, steps and uh, they go in the opposite way of the uh, uh, gradient with a hyper parameter, eta, which corresponds to the um, uh, learning uh, rate. Uh, so if uh, you, you have a small eta, you do small steps between each iteration, and if you have large eta, you do large steps. So the, the convergence uh, is ensured if you don't take a, a too large uh, a learning rate, so this parameter is to be uh, is to be optimized, and also if the, the uh, loss function is um, is uh, convex. Of course, if this, there is a non-convex uh, function, then the, the, the optimization can also lead to a local minima in which the, the, the method is trapped. Actually, in neural networks, there is no guarantee of uh, convexity. But what is observed empirically is that uh, the, this uh, loss function has some shapes like you have a, a steppy Uh, edgy uh, uh, a part here, and then you have ridges uh, where a lot we, you can find a lot of local minima, but uh, all of them almost have the same uh, performance, so that you have no guarantee to have always the same um, uh, convergence to the same uh, uh, same model. But all these variants of models somehow have the similar uh, similar performances. So uh, let's uh, go specifically to uh, how neuron works by uh, looking at the formal uh, neuron as introduced in 1943. 
So we have uh, signals, uh, input signals coming from a, a vector and uh, which are uh, sent to a neuron which give an output white hat. And what's inside this neuron is basically uh, a weighted sum like we had uh, in the very uh, first uh, slides of the, of the talk uh, today. Like when I explain the convolution uh, in this way, so you take the, the value of your x, you multiply by uh, w the, the weight, so just just the weighted sum, and you just add a, a bias b, uh, which is a scalar, and then you pass this weighted sum uh, through an activation uh, function, which will be a nonlinear function in order to produce uh, y hat the output. So uh, basically. Uh, you can see this in this way, where W is a normal vector to an hyperplan, uh, and B, the, the bias that you adjust in order to uh, fix, for instance, the, the boundary between two, uh, two, uh, two classes. Uh, activation function, there are different uh, uh, a popular uh, a choice. It can be uh, a step, a v uh, step, or a sigmoid, or an hyper uh, uh, hyperbolic tangent, and uh, variants, which are called uh, RILU, uh, that we will see later. Uh, so there is, of course, an analogy with the biological neuron, as already explained, where uh, you have this weighted sum corresponding to the, uh, what, the action of pooling uh, on uh, neurons. Uh, integration of the of the currents, uh, electrical currents, which are coming to the cell body, and then if it passes a sufficient amount of uh, of energy, then uh, it goes uh, uh, to the next uh, neurons. So if the uh, scalar product W uh, transpose X plus B is above the, the threshold, then uh, the neuron is activated. We provide one. And otherwise, it's zero. So now we need to define a, a loss function. Uh, for binary classification, uh, a natural uh, idea would be to say, okay, if the prediction is equal to the, the model, uh, to, the, to the ground truth, then we have one. And if it's, uh, uh, sorry, if the, the prediction is different from the, the model, then we have one error. So since we want to minimize, we, we make something uh, uh, large here when we do an error. And if we don't do any errors, meaning if the prediction is equal to the uh, model, then we have zero. Actually, uh, the difficulty with this idea, which is the, the most natural, the most obvious, is that it's not differentiable. So that we cannot take, uh, let's say, the confusion matrix as a, as a matrix that we will uh, directly uh, uh, optimized. Uh, instead of this, uh, a common solution is to design a surrogate function that will be an upper bound of this blue uh, blue line. So, and uh, this upper bound should be something which is smooth, so when we can do gradient descent, uh, so that we can have a, a, a global minimization which can be done uh, easier. So there are uh, variants such like the uh, inch uh, loss corresponding to this uh, expression or even the binary cross entropy or the logistic uh, loss which are uh, plotted uh, here on the uh, green and uh, red uh, line. I encourage you, uh, maybe uh, I'm not going to do it in the video, but we can uh, go back to, to it in the, in the question, if you want, to, to, to have a look at uh, this uh, online application called TensorFlow Playground, on which you can test many uh, variants of uh, the uh, of uh, uh, of this uh, classification problem with a basic uh, 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 artificial uh, neuron, and know, which you will learn uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, intuitively understand the impact of uh, various uh, parameters that I presented here. So now let's go deep inside uh, convolutional uh, neural uh, network. Uh, We will now consider. Uh, we will now consider uh, images, and 
not just a single neuron, and we will explain how uh, what the link between single neuron and uh, and images here. So imag imagine we have uh, uh, images to be classified, and they have a size of 32 by 32 pixels, and these are uh, RGB uh, color images. And so uh, what we will do is uh, use uh, convolutional uh, layers. Uh, so we already recall what is a, a, a convolution. So since we have a, a 32 by 32 by 3 uh, image, we will take uh, also uh, filters which are uh, colored, uh, meaning having three uh, three layers, and we will consider a kernel of convolution of 5 by 5 or 3 by 3, basically the, the smallest that can be uh, taken to, uh, to do the convolution. And basically, the operation, I already introduced this twice uh, when we were talking about a single neuron, but also in convolution, and there is a clear analogy with what is done, that the convolution will be the product of this WT, the, the numbers in the convolution kernel, by the uh, input data X plus, uh, plus B. And this will be uh, swept on the, uh, entire, uh, on the entire image. Because uh, there is an issue when you come to the edge of the image, uh, typically, basically, the, the image will be reduced by uh, 28 by, uh, by 28, and most of the time, also, the three uh, layers are then combined with a, a linear uh, a combination, but you can also, if you have information in the color, keep separately uh, the, the, different, uh, the different colors. Uh, so this output here corresponds to uh, the output of uh, an activation uh, map, the output of a single uh, uh, neuron. And then you can, let's say, take several of these uh, of these uh, neurons. So take an, another uh, another filter that will produce another activation uh, uh, map, and so on. So for instance, here. I consider an image of uh, 32 by 32 by 3 and produce, uh, consider six neurons, which are all doing a, convol uh, a convolution and for which the, the weights of the kernel will be uh, optimized. And I end up with uh, this kind of a stack of, uh, of uh, images where I have six uh, images corresponding to activation map, the output of a, of a neuron with a size of 28 by 28. So this is the new image uh, corresponding to the encoding after a convolution layer through the uh, neural network. So as we said uh, earlier, um, uh, a neural network needs an activation uh, function. And uh, because if it was only linear combination of uh, the input image, it will bring no decision making. And what is done here is uh, instead of the hyperbolic tangent or the uh, nonlinear uh, heaviside function, is to take a ReLU. ReLU is basically rectifying li linear unit. It's uh, equal to zero below the, the threshold and then it's just linear. So everything below a threshold is put to zero and the rest of it is kept. And then we will have uh, uh, basically concatenation of cells of uh, this way. Uh, we do convolution with a certain number of uh, filters, uh, nonlinear uh, activation function, and then again and again. So, um, basically, this is why all the architecture will look this way where we have uh, uh, here an architecture which, which, which takes uh, as an input a color image, which has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 neurons, so meaning 10 images that uh, are going to be uh, produced. We pass it through uh, the rectified linear unit, putting everything to zero except what is above the, the threshold, and then another convolution, and then a ReLU, and, and, and so on, up to the final uh, decision where, uh, based on what is the, in the image, you decide if it belongs to uh, a car, a truck, uh, uh, or another, another class. So this final, um, this final uh, decision is called a fully connected, uh, a 
fully connected uh, uh, layer, which corresponds to a classical uh, biological neuron, as I presented earlier. So there are stuff that I didn't present it so far, which are called pooling, that we're going to see uh, just uh, right now. So pooling layers, uh, the idea is that uh, before we take the final decision, uh, we need to reduce the dimension. Uh, because um, if you have too large of an image and you take, you decide you have information everywhere uh, in each single uh, uh, neuron, you will have too much information and actually the robustness of the algorithm would be very poor on this. And actually this is uh, thanks to the, uh, this kind of tricks that the performance uh, improved uh, a lot uh, at the beginning of the year 2010. So the idea is that when you want to take a decision, uh, imagine you are at the Quai d'Orsay, uh, so the impression is stable. If you have, if you are looking for on on dash on, on dots uh, on the uh, on, on the on the uh, in, 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 in front of a painting, then you just see only few part of the the problem, and while you go. Away from it, you, you start to have the, the full picture. And basically, this is what is done. Uh, to embed a larger and larger context, uh, what is done is to uh, reduce by a certain factor the size of the image and to keep the size of the convolutional uh, kernel the, the same, so that these convolutional kernels embed actually a, a larger, progressively, a larger uh, range in the original image. Of course, this... Uh, comes with a loss of, re of resolution, but actually since all the layers are connected or concatenated with each other, the information of the high frequency and the low frequency of the uh, images somehow are, uh, are sent through. So this, uh, w there will be different ways of doing this, uh, this pooling, and a, a very common way is to, to take the maximum uh, value. Uh, so here, uh, in this uh, small 2x2 uh, two two matrix, 1, 1, 5, 6, you replace it by the 6, uh, and so on. And it's done with a stride of 2, meaning that uh, you, you jump by, uh, by 2 uh, pixels uh, here to reduce a 4x4 four four matrix into a 2x2 two two matrix. The fully connected uh, uh, layer uh, contains neurons that connect uh, to the uh, entire uh, volume as an ordinary uh, neural network, uh, similarly to the biological uh, network that I presented, and, uh, which is uh, made uh, accessible in, um, in TensorFlow Playground. So there is a warning that uh, in the end, um, uh, if you assume you have a database of, uh, let's say, as I indicated, thousands of images, 2,000 images of size 256 by 256, the number of parameters that your uh, neural network is going to have is 5 by 5 by uh, 3, uh, your, your kernel, plus 1, the bias, so 50, uh, 76 parameters. Uh, if you have uh, 10 neurons, as we said, that's 760 parameters for each layer, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 uh, layers. So in the end, that's a number of parameters which is more or less larger than the amount, the number of images. So there is uh, a large risk of, uh, of uh, overfitting if you take too much parameters compared to the size of the, your image. So, a way to do this is to decrease the complexity of your network, and it's often the case when we have, uh, let's say, um, uh, small images, which, which can happen uh, for uh, in vivo uh, or in vitro um, microscopy, to get more real data, uh, which is, of course, uh, painful uh, if uh, the, the data don't come easily. One possibility is to simulate uh, data. It's business now in itself to, uh, to simulate uh, fake data uh, by simulation and also to train on similar uh, data and, uh, and, and, and transfer. Uh, so if you have a data which looks uh, similar to the one uh, you, you, you care for. So now uh, we are uh, ready for uh, deep learning. Of course, it's a very fast uh, um, introduction, but uh, which gives you the, the, the global uh, spirit. The nice thing is that we have advanced interfaces. Uh, we have um, uh, and, uh, so 
the, the, the reality of it actually is that uh, uh, it's ready to be used, but uh, it's not a, a nice thing. But we have relatively advanced interfaces. There are a lot of uh, hyperparameters to be to be tuned: number of layers, uh, um, learning rate, uh, duration of the the training. There's a lot of uh, annotation to be to be done, and uh, it requires also high computation, uh, computational uh, uh, load. Uh, so. Sometimes people are talking about postal gradient uh, descent because it takes a lot of time to uh, to do to do uh, to do this. Uh, so that was a bottleneck some years ago. But actually, uh, people came with uh, friendlier uh, so solutions uh, that I will go through uh, here. I know Daniel Sage will also give some uh, elements about this in his uh, zero uh, code uh, deep learning uh, solution. Um, so some solution includes uh, uh, deep image, which is uh, uh, ready uh, there to do what is called inference. So if you have an already trained model, you can make it accessible uh, via image, but it doesn't uh, yet include the retraining uh, of the, 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 the model. And so you have a zoo of, uh, of models which are available there in order to be reused and uh, uh, if your images look this way, you can use them, and uh, I guess you will have demo about this uh, later in the training. You have for didactical use uh, NIME, which, uh, if you don't like code, uh, can do uh, uh, can be useful by connecting modules in this way, where you can really uh, see all the layers connected uh, here in order to take a final uh, uh, decision. Which is super didactic, but uh, a bit slow, especially if you use uh, the free version of it. Enjoy has been uh, proposed uh, uh, by Wei Yang, uh, which uh, is an online uh, uh, version of the uh, different uh, existing uh, networks. And uh, a, a nice step, a nice move was this zero cost deep learning for, for Mike, which is basically providing a lot of uh, accessible uh, standard architecture of deep learning uh, network uh, through a collab uh, uh, deployment. So all the codes are available uh, and uh, you can use them for your own uh, images. Uh, however, there is no classification here, it's mostly uh, segmentation and uh, denoising. Cellpose is uh, super nice for uh, segmentation here also. And uh, some commercial solutions are already, uh, already uh, there, uh, but with some limitation at the moment because you, you lose a lot of elements to, uh, to know about the hyperparameter and sometimes to publish, that can be a, a limitation. A global view of this jungle is this way. For some, you can do only the inference, meaning using them. For some of them, you can use for training. Computational uh, can be local or can be on the on the cloud. These clouds can be public or private. And uh, you can have uh, galleries of model or do-it-yourself uh, 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 code, meaning uh, adapting to your own uh, uh, images and it can be freeware or uh, it can be uh, um, soft for which you have to, to, to pay for the, uh, for the access. Unfortunately, most of them don't provide a, a, a generic classification uh, a problem because maybe these are simpler architecture than uh, segmentation or denoising uh, uh, problem. And also that um, uh, in microscopy, we may have images which don't have the same size as the standard model that we find in uh, computer vision for uh, outside the, the microscopy world. And then in this case, uh, you have to adapt the, the, the architecture. And this is what we will see uh, in the hands -on. So, uh, in this end, you can have uh, uh, a view of three type of user uh, of deep learning, either basic, no machine learning knowledge, just give me a working model to make my prediction, that's the deep image approach. You can have an intermediate uh, level, I want to retrain a working model on my personal data, and you can have an advanced uh, profile where I want to develop my custom deep learning models. A limitation of the uh, intermediate uh, level, which I believe you are uh, here in, in the 
et de, et de courses. Is that you are uh, for the zero cost deep learning for my chronic on Google Collab, which need to pay for privacy and sufficient computing resources. And source code are uh, only personalized for uh, microscopy applications. So if you run outside for uh, for this, then uh, you may have some um, specificity which are not addressed uh, in here. So uh, 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 a nice alternative to zero cost deep learning for uh, for Mike is to uh, use uh, as a European the European Grid Infrastructure, EGI, which provides uh, something like called um, Deep AS, uh, which is a, a deep learning as a service uh, system, which where on which you will recover the same uh, three level of, uh, of user, basic prediction, intermediate criterion, and advanced uh, uh, develop, uh, on, and that you can have access to Uh, via uh, your, our European call uh, for a given uh, time. So for us, uh, in my group, we have uh, three years access uh, to, uh, to the GPU and, uh, and uh, we don't have to provide our data set uh, to, uh, to Google to do our uh, stuff. And the, the, the nice thing about it is that you can collaborate also in a network. So it's pretty uh, uh, useful if you uh, work connectedly with several uh, groups uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. If you are working locally, then your own cloud uh, in your uh, institute may be uh, good enough. So the take home message is that uh, we have defined what is classification. We have uh, given the measure of, uh, so basically you take an image as an input and you give a class as an output. How classification are measured via uh, the confusion matrix and different combination of, of them. We have seen methods for uh, supervised classification, define it, where you have your uh, training data set that you annotate images, giving a class to an image. You, you have uh, environment, software environment to do this that we pointed. We have seen the basic of supervised classification with uh, with deep learning, uh, where you um, you consider a concatenation of uh, layers of uh, convolution, non-linear uh, functions, uh, activation function, most of the time ReLU, pooling, uh, and then in the end the final uh, decision on a reduced uh, the dimension. And we have pointed deep learning based classification on the on the cloud having um, uh, Google Collab as a good pedagogical tool to, to train, and this will be what we will demo to you in the hands-on, but also uh, public uh, version of them if you don't want to provide your, uh, your data to, uh, to, to Google. Uh, so, in the, as a follow-up, uh, you will do hands-on with Erari and Felix on Zero Cost Deep Learning for Mike, and if you want to know more about uh, Uh, deep uh, AS on the EGI, visit our YouTube channel, Imorphan YouTube channel, to learn more because we have demo on how it works and the capabilities of it. Thanks for your uh, attention and I'll be ready for uh, questions.